morning, beloved. Good morning. We are continuing in our sermon series on the great I am, the wonderful and blessed identity of God given to us. And Jesus has already revealed to himself through this series as the truth. After his arrest, in the midst of his trial, Jesus will reveal to us a precious truth that, quite frankly, doesn't want to be heard. But it must be said nonetheless. A great truth that pierced the anger and the hatred of that night, like a fierce torch in the pitch black. So it is with truth, especially one that bears peace in the face of aggression. The late Dr. A.T. Pearson told the following story of General Robert E. Lee. Hearing Robert Lee speak in the highest terms, President Davis, about a certain officer, another officer, greatly astonished, said to him, General, do you not know that the man of whom you speak so highly to the President is one of your bitterest enemies and misses no opportunity to malign you? Yes, replied General Lee. But the President asked my opinion of him, and I gave him a true answer. He did not ask his opinion of me. You see, truth is truth. And sometimes the most powerful truths come when only lies, when only hate, when only anger have been spoken. It makes fertile ground for a truth to be heard. Longfellow's poem, Hand of Truth, rings true with its own words. The nimble lie is like the second hand upon the clock. We see it fly. Within the hour hand of truth seems to stand still, yet it moves unseen. And wins at last, for the clock will not strike till it has reached its goal. See, the world spins its lies like the second hand of a clock. 24-7 it ticks and tucks. But there is one truth inescapable, one truth the world simply cannot shush, but surely wishes it could. That truth is, Jesus is the Christ. I will say again, Jesus is the Christ. Amen. And by the Christ, we live. By the Christ, we forgive. By the Christ, we know peace. Even as the world rages and wars upon us and upon him most precious, by the Christ we know peace. Turn with me to Mark chapter 14. That's the gospel of Mark chapter 14. We're going to begin with verses 55 through 62. Mark chapter 14, beginning with verse 55. Now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. For many bore false witness against him, but their testimony did not agree. And some stood up and bore false witness against him, saying, We heard him say, I will destroy this temple that is made with hands, and in three days I will build another not made with hands. Yet even about this, their testimony did not agree. And the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, Have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. Again, the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. I am. That still gives me chills. The conviction the courage, the quiet strength. Last week, we talked about the authority and the power of Christ on display, even as he was arrested. Arrested, but not taken. Because he stepped forward towards his accusers and asked them their business. 
He identified himself and leveled them with his words. And then he surrendered to them after such a, a casual demonstration of his power, a mere flicker, the tiniest of trickle, enough to defeat them. And he then surrenders into their power that they and we would know that their power is as nothing. Here Jesus continues his great display of strength through restraint. Now we like easy and obvious, don't we? We think strength is vanquishing your enemies. Jesus shows us that greater strength is not needing to. We think of strength as conquest. Jesus shows us that greater strength is mercy. For only from a position of power and defense can one show mercy. Jesus is assailed left and right, but not with fists. Not yet. He is assailed with lies, and those are far more deadly than a closed hand. Witnesses after witness comes against him with their lies, their paid collusion, their attempt to drown the gospel in a sea of lies as they poison the well. Matthew 26, 59 makes it clear that this was a deliberate perversion of justice, saying now the chief priests and the whole council were seeking false testimony against Jesus that they might put him to death. This was no pursuit of truth or justice. It was trumping up charges to destroy this man and in the menace of his mercy and grace. But we're no stranger to that, are we? The world today is full of locked-in biases and prejudices that are resolute. No one is, no one is seeking truth anymore. They all have their truth and only seek confirmation and validation of their opinions. No one is concerned with the facts anymore. We all have our own facts to support whatever we want and blindly ignore everything else. There is no trustworthy source of information or hard facts or unbiased truth in the world because everyone, everyone, everyone has allowed their biases, and I do mean everyone, not just the them you're thinking of, everyone, we have allowed our biases to blind us to truth. And where no common ground can be found, no dispute can be settled. We don't even argue with each other anymore. We don't even argue at one another. We argue past each other. We argue to hear the sound of our own voice. And no one is listening to the voice of God. The voice of God is the truth in the world. The voice of God is the power and the authority spoken of last week that is immutable, unchangeable, unstoppable, truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us, God, is the path of peace. Wherever it leads us, wherever we find ourselves, if we are led there by truth, it is the right place for the right reasons, the right way, because that's what truth is. Now, we used to be able to agree on that. Even if our hypotheses differed, we could agree on the end result of truth. But the world no longer even values truth, let alone believes it exists. We live in a world of confusion, drinking deep from poisoned wells. And many can no longer recognize the truth, even when they hold it in their hands. The world today is just as it was in that kangaroo court the night of Christ's betrayal. And just like then, just like them, the world today thinks just like the Pharisees. That in the midst of the misinformation and the deliberate lies, they think they're riding the wave of chaos, controlling it, guiding it for their purposes. And just like the Pharisees, they are wrong. The world isn't riding the wave, it's drowning in it. There will come a time when the world tries to take a breath and find its lugs are filled from that poisoned well. So how do we escape it? How do we stop drowning? How do we even recognize 
that we're drowning. Last week we said the solution is always to turn our eyes upon Jesus. He is whom we see. In every story and study of Scripture, I always say that we should ask ourselves two questions. What is God doing, and who are we in the story? Now, we're not always the plucky protagonist. We're rarely the hero. In that room, that night, we're the false witnesses. Manipulated by principalities, powers, rulers of the darkness of the world, and spiritual witness, wickedness in high places to spread their false witness in all its shapes and forms. And we don't even realize it as we testify against Jesus with our words if we do not profess him. And as we are manipulated into testifying against Jesus with our deeds if we do profess him. And what then is God doing in the midst of this story? Nothing. Wait, nothing? Ah, but nothing is something. Nothing in the right context can be everything. Lies, slanders, perjury, and Jesus says nothing. This is the continuation of his quiet strength. The world cares little for truth. The world cares little one way or the other. What the world wants is hysteria. The world wants you to be afraid. More than afraid, fearful, anxious, worried. The world wants you perpetually rocked onto your heels. And when we get acclimated to whatever the new normal is that they present, they push the edge more and more until yesterday's edge seems comfortable in comparison. The world wants you defensive. And it'll say anything to get a rise out of you. The world is full of violence of words and thought and wants you right in the midst of it. Us versus them, playing both sides against each other. And all along, the devil laughs. One way or the other, he cares little so long as we're busy working ourselves up, filled with hate and anger that no one's going the way. That's his petty win. Are you tired? Of letting the devil win. Are you tired of living in fear? Are you tired of being led by the nose through the puppet theater? How do we turn it around? How do we stop the cycle and get off the ride? How do we bring it down and defeat it? Do you want to know when the devil was most frustrated? When the world was fuming in its impotence, in that room, in that seat of power, in that cloud of false witnesses, when everything, anything was said, so long it was said against Jesus, and Jesus in the face of their power, in the face of their lives, in the face of their hate, Jesus was at peace. And oh, the devil raised sailed with a storm of injustice, knowing what they wanted to do to him, knowing what they were doing to him, and in the midst of it all, he was completely at peace. Silent. Isaiah 53, verses 6 and 7, written before this prophecy of this saying, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each one has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid upon him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. Beloved, the peace that passeth all understanding was the quiet strength of Jesus, showing ultimate restraint in the face of iniquity, oppression, and affliction. Because the world could not intimidate him. The world could not agitate him from his place of peace. Despite all of its raging and deceit. The temper tantrum of the world could not budge the peace of Jesus. Not one inch. He didn't let them. Beloved, I know he's Jesus and we aren't. But we can learn this power. This power was given to us. 
John 14, 27, Jesus says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. This power was given us. The peace that proved itself fearless and untouchable, impenetrable to the chaos of the world, he gives to you. The power is ours to likewise be untouchable to the wickedness of the world, to have the strength to be silent in the face of foolishness that's only trying to lure us into the mud with the pig, and the strength to answer with simple truth after a storm of lies. Jesus was strong in his peace because it didn't matter what lie was told or how many people were telling it. He knew the truth. And that was enough. We know the truth. We have seen it. We have searched and glory be. It has found us. We know the truth. And that is enough. So that like Christ, we may wait patiently, peacefully through the storm for an honest question, ready to speak truth. In response to lies, Jesus was silent. But in verses 60 and 61 of Mark 14, and the high priest stood up in the midst and asked Jesus, have you no answer to make? What is it that these men testify against you? But he remained silent and made no answer. But when an honest question was asked, then an honest question was answered, and the truthful answer given. The testimony of the life of Jesus, knowing it would mean his death, the quiet strength of Jesus to give the honest answer. Mark 14, verses 61 and 62, again the high priest asked him, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed? And Jesus said, I am. And you will see the Son of Man seated at the right hand of power, coming with the clouds of heaven. I am. Amen. Two words, enough to condemn the one that came to save. Two words, enough to save all who deserve condemnation, if we would but hear. I say it was an honest question, even as the high priest did not like the answer. It was an honest question because it cut through all the pomp and circumstance, all the show, all the disingenuous spin and fear to build their narrative, to justify their actions. And none of it was working anyway. I think it was sheer frustration at that point. The high priest was so exasperated that they couldn't get anything out of Jesus that he actually stops trying to come at him sideways and instead comes directly at Jesus to be surprised by the Son of God giving him the straight answer he would never expect. Honest people expect honesty. Tricksters and charlatans expect sly as they apply their sly and con. At any point that night, any point, they could have saved themselves a lot of trouble, a lot of coin being feckless false witnesses, a lot of corruption and graft in their own collusion to condemn him if they had just asked him outright who he was. If they were simply paying attention during his many years of ministry and actually listening to what he was saying instead of just thinking of their own counter arguments. He has been saying all along throughout this sermon series exactly who he was Amen. and is and is to come. Amen. And in their aggravated mistake, Jesus gives them all the ammunition they need. He proclaims, I am the Christ. I am the Son of the Blessed. I am the Son of Man. I am seated at the right hand of power. I am coming with the clouds of heaven. I am, so says the Christ, Hallelujah. the Messiah, God's anointed one. And more than all that, in and through all that, he first simply says, I am Yahweh, 
the name of God. His name above all names. Mark 14, verses 63 to 65, and the high priest tore his garments and said, What further witnesses do we need? You have heard his blasphemy. What is your decision? And they all condemned him as deserving death. And some began to spit on him and to cover his face and to strike him, saying to him, Prophecy. And the guards received him with blows. Hear now, come with after the lies didn't work. The charge justifying the execution they had already planned was blasphemy. Unironically, the Pharisees condemned Jesus for saying his name, for telling them the truth they didn't want to hear, that their bias wouldn't let them consider for one second, let alone accept it. <coughs> Jesus told them who he was. And the world told him he was whom they didn't want. Here he is. He may not be the God you were expecting. He may not be the God that you prefer. He's certainly not the God that you can control and manipulate. You can't make him do anything. And they were certainly fuming about that in that room. But he is and was and will always be I am who I am. The God that we need. And praise God. The God that we have. Only in this backwards, upside down world can a man be condemned for telling the truth. And if you don't think that's the same today, open your eyes. Chris Harrison was the host of The Bachelor for 20 years. Recently, there was some controversy surrounding a contestant, and that actually doesn't matter. It's not about the contestant or about the controversy. Chris Harrison said, and I quote, We all need to have a little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion. And he was fired. Today, as it was in the days of the Pharisees, a little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion is asking too much. A little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion is the path of reconciliation, but the world doesn't want to reconcile. A little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion is the path of forgiveness, but the world no longer forgives. A little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion is the path of Jesus, the Christ, but the world does not want Jesus. It did not then. Does not now. And just like then, what the world needs now, what the world has always needed, is Jesus Christ. To turn our hearts, to open our eyes, to give us a little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion. And it is up to us to give Him to them. It is up to us to be like Him. In a world that will return evil for your good. The sheep that would not bleat. The accused that would not rise but rose above. Rose from the grave to give us the fullness of grace. The fullness of understanding. The fullness of compassion. He calls to us to not respond to hate and lies in this world with hate and lies. He requires us. To measure our tone and our voice to speak truth. Even if it's a truth they don't want to hear. So that we may show them a little grace. A little understanding. A little compassion. I don't want to. I don't want to. It's far more satisfying fighting back it seems. But you don't find peace on the other side of satisfaction. No. Peace is on the opposite end of satisfaction. See, that's the world in me. That's the lie I've swallowed, the poison pill I'm drinking up. I want to fight back, but I need to give peace a chance. 
Not the world's foe of peace, but Jesus' peace that he paid dearly that night to give to me. Because it's not about them deserving it. They don't. It's not even about me giving it. Truth be told, I'm not. We're just passing along a little of what we have received. Because it's about Him. It's about the Christ. It's about the Savior that saved the world by not returning evil for evil, or even good for good. He returned His good for our evil, and has gotten no short amount of flat for it over the years. Still, he did it. Still, he is it. Still, we must be like him. The week before last, my family went on spring break trip to Key West, which meant flying into Miami. From my short trip from the airport to the airport hotel, I encountered a good amount of hostility and frustration and unprofessionalism. But I can't judge a whole city from a snip. Getting to the hotel lobby after many frustrating failures from the hotel's lack of fulfilling their end of our contract, I came to the front desk just shy of midnight. I have tired children laid out in the lobby hearing all manner of worldliness from the guests. And after a somewhat patient wait, it is my turn to approach the counter. And I wait to be asked to step forward. And I wait to a little bit more to even be acknowledged. And I wait, and I wait some more, until finally the woman behind the desk, the night manager at that, initiates our conversation. I promise you I have not said a word yet. She initiates our conversation not with a hello or how can I help you, but she says to me, you got a question or something because I'm done. Ma'am, I need to check in. Then go over there. And she storms up. I discover from the poor employee trying to fight fires that I was rudely directed to that the room that I paid for was taken and we were being bumped down. And the taxi that I had to pay for because half an hour of ringtones for their shuttle service that didn't come could have been comped had they actually answered the phone and let me know. And this employee attempted to mend things. She offered to comp my room. But the night manager denied approval. Beloved, I did not have the peace or the patience of Christ that night. <laughs> I was tired. I was frustrated. I was mistreated. I wanted justice. No, I didn't. I wanted revenge. I asked for the night manager's name, preparing to have a conversation in the morning with the day man. And I would have been well in my rights as a consumer. I would have been well in my rights dropping a one-star review. But that night, I was tired. Not just physically. Suddenly, I was immensely tired of being tired. Tired of fighting. Tired of carrying the weight of anger. And a power that was not my own. But a power that was given me took my anger away from me, and I forgave. Despite myself, I forgave. Not because the night manager deserved it. She did. But it wasn't about her. And it's really not about me and what I wanted. It's about Jesus. It's about my rock. And the other rock that I was holding so tight and it was drawing blood from my palm. He opened my finger. And he let it fall from my hand. The weight of it. I no longer carry it. As he took my burden away. He let me take a breath. Oh, and it wasn't water from the poison well. That night he was the air I the Christ who forgave me my trespasses. He taught me to forgive. 
to give the benefit of the doubt to a woman that was clearly overwhelmed by a really bad night. And let it just be a bad night and not turn to a bad week for me. The benefit of the doubt that it was not her at her best. A rough night and she lost her cool and I know I've been there before. And I wouldn't want someone judging me only by seeing me on my worst day. I know I would want to be forgiven. And I have been. Denzel Washington asked the question, if you had $86,400 and someone sold, sold, stole 60 bucks, would you throw away $86,340 for revenge? Or move on and live? Each of us have 86,400 seconds every day. Don't let someone's negative 60 seconds ruin the remaining 86,300. Life is bigger than that, and so are you. Amen. I could carry that anger throughout my vacation. I could carry that anger through my life. Or I could let it go. I could confess my own frustrations and the glory of God that overcame it. I could stop letting the world get into my heart. And instead, let the Lord out of my heart and into the world. You see, we can all stop the spin, stop the cycle, stop the chaos. And we can let the Lord, let the Christ hold our tongues when we want to shout. And we can let him unleash our tongues when we prefer to be silent. We can look to the Christ in the midst of a far greater injustice than any of us will ever face and learn how to face the world with a little grace, a little understanding, a little compassion, a little more of him, and a lot less of me. Amen. Amen. See, that's who Christ is. He's the Savior, and he saves us from our stuff. When Jesus answered the question during the night of his arrest, he wasn't hitting one out of the park for the choir. He wasn't just saying it for us. He was telling them the truth. He witnessed the saving truth to his enemies as they worked against him. He gave them a glimpse of the promise that they could hear it and believe it and have it if they would only hear the simple, peaceful, powerful truth spoken in that world. The only truth spoken that night. Jesus Christ evangelized in his trial. And so can we. In our trial, we can confess the truth of God and how we bear the peace of Christ. The God the world doesn't want, but the God the world needs. We need a champion, and he is our champion. We need a king, and he is our king. We need a guide, a healer, a teacher, and he is our guide, our healer, our teacher. We have all these things in the Christ, but what we most need is a Savior. What we need most is a Christ. Because Christ, he saves us from our sins. Pray Heavenly Father, you knew as you formed this world what we would make of it. And yet, Lord, you made it anyway. You knew as you formed this world what we would do to you. And you loved us anyway. Father, you knew as you sent your Son to us what we would do to him. And you sent him anyway. Jesus Christ, throughout all the pain and the rejection and the injustice, the ingratitude that the world threw at you and continues to throw at you, still you march to the cross. Still you clung to it, Lord, not by nails, but 
by love. Still you held yourself there, not by justice, but by the quiet strength that received our injustice. To give us the mercy we do not deserve or we need. You gave us, Lord, grace and understanding and compassion. And we have not repaid that well. Not just the world, Lord. Your church has not repaid that well. You have taught us, Lord, in your parables. Then in order to show gratitude for the grace that we have, we must turn around and show grace in kind. The greatness of your grace we have been given, and you ask us only to give a small measure of grace to our neighbor, our friend, our enemy, our anyone. You ask us, Lord, to pass along a trickle of the power that flows endlessly like a waterfall into our hearts. And Lord, I think if we were doing a better job of it, our churches would be more full right now. So teach us again, Lord, what grace is. Teach us again, Lord, what understanding is. Teach us again, Lord, what compassion is. That we may show the world who you are. Because we know you better. Better today than yesterday. And Lord, I look forward to the tomorrow when I can see you face to face. The greatest joy imaginable is for my Christ to look me in the eye, address me, or oh, me personally. Who am I? And you are mindful of me. But for you to look at me and say, Dear one, well done. Give us the courage to lean upon your quiet strength when we don't want to, Lord. That we may do well with the gospel we have been given. With the God we have been given. With the Jesus Christ that we have. Thank you, Lord. That in the midst of hate and lies, world of fear and confusion, you were unafraid, unflinching, unashamed to say that you were Christ. Give us the courage, the fearlessness, the boldness to show the Christ we have. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Hymn number 170.